chapter and the 17th verses through the 24th verses. Let us listen for a word from the Lord. Mark chapter 9 verses 17 through 24. Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever he, it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help him, help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. As you take your seat, say the tension of faith. The tension of the tension of faith. On last week, we talked about the four steps of faith. Tension is the first step of faith, followed by resistance, which is the second step of faith. The third step of faith is repetition. And the last step is rest. We talked about the significance of building our faith muscles, just like we build physical muscles. How many work out? How many work out? I know some of y'all work out, so I'm looking for y'all to raise your hand because I know some of y'all work out. When you build those muscles, it requires these four things. Physically, it requires tension. It requires resistance. It requires repetition, and it requires rest. Today, we look at the tension of faith, the first step. But they could not. They could, but they did not know they could. In Mark chapter 9, verse 28, his disciples asked him privately. There was a crowd around them. But they pulled Jesus aside because they were embarrassed. And they asked Jesus privately, why could we not cast it out? Touch your neighbor and say, you can, but you don't know you can. You can, you can, you can but you don't know you can. You, you have the power of faith working in your favor, but you just don't know you can. They could, but they did not know they could. This is the tension of faith. The tension of faith is if you can believe, 
that all things are possible. Verse 23 of chapter 9 of Mark, it says, Jesus said to him, if you can believe. I'm talking to people today who need to believe. I want us to get in our spiritual self today and for the rest of our life, get out of our emotions. Get out of our own understanding, our own imagination, our own intellect, and get into faith. I want some people who can believe. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. With what we're dealing with today, we need some people who can believe. All of these people that's running their mouth, all of these people that's doing all this other stuff, fighting on this side, fighting on that side, but we need some people who can believe. Because Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. The tension of faith is the first of our four steps of faith that we will deal with in this series, the success to su the faith to succeed, the faith to succeed, tension and resistance and repetition and rest. Say it with me, tension, resistance repetition and rest. These are the steps of faith. These are the steps that you're going to need to put into action when you come up against problems and trouble in life. How many going through some stuff right now? Anybody? You, you going through some things right now? There's some things in your life, people in your life, stuff in your life. Some of the stuff is from your past. Some of it you're dealing with now. Some of the things you're facing in your future but you got to have faith you got to believe God the tension of faith we're up against a lot life on this earth here and now we live in a state of constant tension the reality of pain the sobering reality of suffering the stress of separation the devastation of death, the heart of, heartache of pain. Yet there is in life the reality of joy. Even in the midst of life happening to us, there is the reality of comfort. Even when life happens and even when things look at their worst, God still has redemption. God still has grace. God still has mercy and God has love. And all of this is happening at the same time as all this other stuff is happening. How many know God is faithful and loving? We're up against a lot. We got to let God be God. Our part is to use our faith in order to participate with God. Let me, let me say that again. We got to let God be God. Our part is to participate with God. In order to participate with God, we got to use our faith. See, we got to understand that our life is in his hands. Our situation is in his hands. Whenever something happens into our life, comes into our life, we got to understand it's in his hands. Touch your neighbor and say, you can. You just got to believe you can. You are what you believe. That's who you are. I know who you are. And I know what you believe by where you are. Your life becomes what you believe. If you can believe when you are suffering, if you can believe when you are hurting, the tension of faith, because we don't always feel faith. Huh? We, 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 we sometimes struggle to have faith. 
But if we can believe when we are about to lose our house, if we can believe when I'm about to lose my car, they're about to take it. If I can believe when I don't have enough money to pay my bills, that's the tension of faith. When trouble comes, can I believe? When my enemies look like they're getting the best of me, can I still believe? Even Jesus asked, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In other words, God, where are you? As Jesus was on that cross hanging between heaven and earth, he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? David said in his darkest hour, when he felt abandoned by God, Anybody ever felt abandoned by God? Anybody in here? David, that great warrior, David, the greatest king in the Bible, the greatest king that ever lived, wrote many of the Psalms. David said these words in Psalm 13 when he felt abandoned by God. How long, O oh Lord? Will you forget me forever? This father brings his son who is convulsing. He brings his son. Verse 9 of Mark chapter 20 says, When they brought him to him, and when he saw him immediately, the spirit convulsed him. When they brought him to Jesus, immediately the spirit convulsed. We are convulsing. That's what's happening in America. America is convulsing. Our children are convulsing. What's going on with our children? What's happening to our young men and our young women? Why are they behaving the way they're behaving? Why is there so much violence? Why is all this happening? Because our children are convulsing. There is one trillion, a one trillion dollar wealth gap. What used to be rich is now middle class. And what used to be middle class is now poor. It doesn't matter if unemployment is low, if there still isn't enough money if you're still not getting paid enough. It doesn't matter if economic zones have come into the inner city, Congressman Rick Scott, if only the rich are doing the building and who are benefiting from the economic stimulus. Internalized racism is something that convulses us. Listen, convulsion is a corrective response. Convulsion is a corrective response that, that the system will have in order to correct what is wrong. Convulsion means that something is happening, something is changing. When they brought him to Jesus, he convulsed. We all suffer from internalized racism. If you're an American, if you live in America, we all suffer from internalized racism. Whether you're black, whether you're brown, whether you're white, whether you're rich, or whether you're poor, Martin Luther King said this. He says, it is much easier to integrate a lunch counter or a public park than it is to have equality where we treat everybody right. At the end of his life, he, he said it, it, it was easy to get people to march and to sit in and to fight with me as long as I was integrating. But when I said it's time for equality, it was much more difficult because we all have internalized racism. Because we 
do not have a democracy. They like to say America is a democracy, but America has never been a democracy. America is a plutocracy. It is a oligarchy. The moment that America chose instead of Plymouth Rock, which wasn't the purest form, but it chose instead that Jamestown, it became an oligarchy where the rich dominate the poor. How do the rich dominate the poor? How do the have dominate the have not? They do it by dividing and conquering us. As long as they can divide us, as long as they can make us believe that one another is the enemy, then they can always have the power. There's more, at least 68 to 69% of America owns less than 1% of the wealth. I'm not going to labor there, but Martin Luther King said in his 1967 speech, The Other America, we played it here on the screen. He said, in this other America, people are poor by the millions, and they find themselves perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. He says, in a sense, the greatest tragedy of this other America is what it does to little children. Little children in this other America are forced to grow up with the clouds of inferiority forming every day in their little mental sky. As we look at this other America, we, we see it as an arena of blasted hopes and shattered dreams. Many people of various backgrounds live in this other America of all races, white, Latino, the largest group in this other America in proportion to its size in the population is the American Negro. The American Negro finds himself living in a triple ghetto. As America continues along this line, other people become more disenfranchised. Look at America today. America ought to be ashamed. America ought to have a conscience. But the reason that America doesn't is because those of us who have faith will not step up. We will not use our faith to conquer. We got to talk about and know the problem, but we got to talk about it. And when we talk about it and face the problem, then we don't talk about the problem no more. We do something about it. Y'all might be quiet. Because we stop talking about the problem and we start talking to the problem. Y'all hear what I'm saying? There comes a time we got to start talking to the problem instead of talking about the problem. We got to face the problem. If you in your family are living in generational poverty, that's got to stop. Come on with me now. We can't have generation after generation after generation in poverty. We cannot afford to have a family who continually, consistently have children who suffer. None of our children should suffer. Can I just talk this moment? Can I talk to you this morning? All of our children are worthy of the best of life and health and, and happiness. Every one of us deal with this convulsion. This convulsion. I have two points and then I'm done today. The first point is they didn't believe they could. They didn't believe they could. One of the things that I see over and over again as a pastor is dealing with people who don't believe they can. It's interesting because we're people of faith. Am I right about it? We're people who Believe in Jesus Christ. Am I right about it? I think I have the right crowd. We're, we're people who have confessed Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we say that he lives in us. And we say that we love him and that we are Christians. 
Well, if that is true, then that means that everything Jesus did, we can do. Come on, somebody. The disciples asked Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. I'm sorry, excuse me, my voice is very dry. That's why I'm drinking. Please forgive me. They only asked Jesus to do two things. Now, now check this out. They, they asked Jesus only for two things. They said, Lord, increase our faith. And they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, check this out. All of the stuff Jesus did, they, 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 I mean, Jesus opened blind eyes. Jesus healed sick. Jesus raised the dead. One day there was a storm out on the ocean and, and then they were on the ship and Jesus was sleeping. And they came to Jesus and say, they said, Jesus, don't you care that we perish? But Jesus didn't say a word to them. Jesus just spoke to the wind and the waves and he said, peace be still. And the wind and the waves shut up, became still. Jesus fed 5,000. With two fish and five lowly, low, loaves of bread. If I was one of the disciples, I would have said, Jesus, teach me to do that. I mean, that seems rational. That seems reasonable. Jesus, teach me how to do all that cool stuff you've been doing. But watch this. The reason they asked him for those two things, because they knew that if they had those, they could do all of that other stuff. If they had faith and if they had the power of prayer, they could do anything. Touch your neighbor and say, if you have faith, you can do anything. If you will just believe, they didn't believe they could. Mark 9 and 18 and 20 says, and whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. And he foams, watch this, at the mouth. And he gnashes. In other words, he's, he's grinding. He's, his teeth. And he becomes rigid. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a lot of folks to me. That sounds like a lot of people. It may not be in this description, but we can break it down and understand that this is exactly the kind of torment and trouble that they're in. And then it says this, so I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out but they could not. He answered him and said, oh, faithless generation. I want you to understand this. He wasn't just talking to his disciples. He was talking to everybody. Come on, touch somebody. Say everybody, 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 everybody. He talking to all y'all. He talking to you, your family, your children, everybody. He talking to the neighbors, the church, everybody. He's talking to everybody who's following him and ought to know that they can do it. I want you in this series of faith to build your faith up. This is the year of faith. This is the year when we're going to get our faith back. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about because you. there was a time some of us, you had faith. You had strong faith. You could believe anything. Oh, I wish the devil would. I wish sickness would try. I, I, wish, I wish I would have a bill. That, oh, I, there was a time we had that kind of faith. But somehow you lost faith. Then there's some you ain't know, you don't know yet about faith. And you need to know about faith. So this year I want to introduce you to the power of faith. The power that faith has to conquer anything. Any enemy, any problem, any sickness, any attack, anything that will come in your life. Faith. 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 So look, look at verse 20. Verse 20 of Mark chapter 9. It says, then they brought him to him. And when he saw him immediately, he convulsed him. Immediately, his spirit, let me tell you something, in him, in the boy, saw the spirit in Jesus and he fell on the ground and he began to roll around on the ground and he began to foam at the mouth. The spirit convulsed him. The spirit convulsed him. The spirit convulsed him. It was not the boy. 
It was the spirit in the boy. You, you got you to gotta get this. Tell somebody, say, you, you, you got to get this. It, it's not your child. It's the spirit in them. It's not your husband. It's the spirit in him. It's not your wife. It's the spirit in him. It's not your boss. It's that spirit. It is not America. It's the spirit. It's not Trump. It's the spirit in them. It's not the Democrats. It's the spirit. It, it's not the Republicans. It's a spirit. There's a spirit in them. And it's causing them to wallow. It's causing them to foam at the mouth. Sometimes look, look at the news, listen to them, watch them. It looks like they're acting crazy, don't it? It looks like they're a fool. Come on, talk to me if you can. Hmm. He falls on the ground. He foams at the mouth. And often the spirit throws him, watch this, to, into the fire. He throws himself into the fire. No, the spirit throws him to the fire. The, the spirit throws him into the water. And why? To destroy him. Why? Because the, 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 the enemy's trick and attack is to kill you. He's not satisfied with you just stop going to church. He's not satisfied with you just stop praying. He's not satisfied if you just stop reading your Bible. He, he's not satisfied if you just start acting like you don't know no better. He wants you dead. Notice how when you begin to move away from church, move away from God, when you stop praying, when you stop believing and, 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 and believing God, notice how hell breaks loose. Am I the only one? Am I the only Notice that when you step away from God and now he thinks he has control over you, now there is nothing seemingly to stop him. Now watch this. Mark 9, verse 25, 29. It says, when Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit. This is faith in action. Somebody say faith in action. This is faith in action. He rebukes the unclean spirit by speaking not to the boy, but to the spirit. Quit fussing and arguing with people and talk to the spirit in people. I dare you to speak to the spirit and not the boy. Speak to the spirit and not the woman. Speak to the spirit and not the man. Speak to the spirit and not your finances. Speaks and he rebukes it. Why? Because it's unclean. What does unclean mean? It's not like God. Put, put it on the script. Put that on the screen. Verse 9, verse 25, 29. Verse 25, this verse 25. It's an unclean spirit. You see, he rebuked what? The unclean what spirit? Saying to the spirit, deaf and dumb spirit. He calls it by his name. You can't be scared to call sexual perversion sexual perversion. You can't be scared and afraid to call poverty poverty. You can't be afraid to call that demon that's trying to steal and kill your relationship what it is. Because we got a lot of stuff that's just generational. It's just been in your family for generations. And you ought to say, I'm the last one in my family. I'm the last one in my generation. I made up my mind. There's not going to be another poor. Put your name in there. In my family, not one more generation is going to have whatever the generational curse is. Divorce, out of wedlock, like pregnancy, incarceration, addiction or whatever addiction is, riding around with, with all kind of foolishness going on. Not another, come on, say it with me, not another generation. Come on, say it. not another generation. Come on, shake somebody's head and say, not another generation of my family will have what I have. Listen, you ought not want your children to go through what you go through. If you had to struggle to get through college, you ought to want them to not have to worry about it. Just have enough money to really study. If you didn't have to worry about getting through college, I don't know if there's any of us in here, but like that. But, but I made that pledge. I made that pledge. 
See, my children are supposed to do better than I did. Glory to God. Look, look what he says. He, he rebukes the unclean spirit by speaking to it, calls it what it is. But I, I want you to get this. Go, go back, put that back up there. Look what he says. I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. You got to say to things in your life that don't belong in your life, I command you. See, you have authority. As a believer, you have authority. You have to take your authority over the things in your life. And then after you take your authority and you command it to stop and you command it to come out, then you got to say, don't ever come again. I don't ever want to see poverty again. I don't ever want to see this sickness again. I don't ever want to see this disease again. I don't ever want to see divorce and separation and brokenness in my family ever again. Look what happens next. We're just going to read this because I'm almost done. Look what happens. Verse 26. Then the spirit cried out. Now notice, the boy is out of the picture. He's there, but he's not the issue. Spirit cried out. Convulse him greatly. And then he did what? He did what? He did what? How many of y'all ready right now for everything in your life that's not supposed to be in your life to come out? Everything in your family, everything in your past to come out. I'm telling you right now, See, you got to make up your mind. It's got to come out. No more fatherlessness. No more brokenness. No more dysfunction. But it's going to cost something. It's going to cost something. That, that's what we're going to talk about. Because this is what? The tension of faith. So it takes tension. I'm the first generation in my family that has done Theological education at the highest level. Now, I'm just going to tell my test. I'm not bragging. I have an earned doctorate. But there's preachers throughout my family. Generation after generation. There's at least, of all the 50 states, there's at least 20 of them got relatives of mine in it preaching and pastoring. All over the United States. But God said to me, when he called me to preach, he said, you have to go to seminary. My sister went to seminary before I did, so I wasn't the first to go to seminary. But he sent me there, and at the time, I didn't know why I had to go. I know now. And it took me years to know why I had to go. You ever felt like, why me? Come on, brother. Come, you know why? We're breaking something. We're destroying something. It, it's tough to be that one. Oh, bless his name. Just tell somebody, say it's hard to be me. If you know what I'm talking about, say it's hard being me, baby. It's hard being me. But, but I'm with it. I got this. I had to go. God said, for what I have you to do, you got to go. I had to uproot my family. We had a business. I did not want to be a pastor. I love preaching, I love being a minister, but I didn't want to be no pastor. Because I said, God, I know how difficult it is to be a pastor, and anybody want to be a pastor got to be crazy. God must think I'm crazy. I don't know. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I said, God, I don't want to do that. I said, what I'm going to do, God, is I'm going to make a deal with you. I'm going to be a businessman. And I'm going to do so well in business, I'm going to make millions, and I'm going to make sure that as I help the pastor, the pastor, the church will never have to worry about finances. How many of y'all know finance is the number one issue in the church? Finance is the number one. Let me tell you, don't believe all these lies and hypes about preachers. It's less than 1% of preachers that got any money. His first lady said that's true. She knows. Money, money and people. And what I mean by that is I mean people who help 
who serve, who will work in the church. So I said, God, what I'm going to do is I'm going to serve, I'm going to work in the church, I'm going to help, I'm going to make sure the pastor gets that off their plate, and I'm going to make enough money to where it, whenever the church needs something, I'm going to give money. God said, no, what I want you to do is I want you to uproot your family, and I want you to move to Atlanta, Georgia. From Denver to Atlanta, we had three children. Am I right, baby? And when we went down there, let me tell you what happened. I went down in January to make sure I had a house and to make sure that I had a job so that I could work and go to school. And I'm, I'm going to have to come down here and tell my story. I, I, I went down in January, I need y'all to hear me, to make sure I had a house and I had work so that I could support my family and go to school. So I came back to Denver. So we all right, right? So then we uproot. We, we get all our stuff. We move from our house. We go down to Atlanta. Guess what happens when we get there? No house. I'm talking about faith. I'm talking about tension of faith. Now keep in mind, God told me I had to go. So you would think that when I got there, since I'd gone down in advance, and I got the house, that it would be there, right? Guess what happened? God had more for me than I had for myself. God saw better for me than I saw for myself. Now, now if you don't get nothing else today, I want you to get this. God gives you more when you start or after you start than before you start. I got a witness over here. God, in other words, wants you to sow the seed. Oh, bless his name. Let me tell you what happened. God gave us a home because we had an apartment. We had an apartment that was not in, it was in southwest Atlanta. <laughs> it wasn't in one of the better areas of town. But that's what I saw. But because I went, I obeyed God, God gave us a house. By me being in that seminary, God began to open up things to me that I could not have gotten had I not gone to seminary. Because seminary makes you not only a person of faith, but you can break down and understand the Hebrew, the Greek. You can look at the cultures. You can break it down. You can understand all the things you need to understand. Now, let me tell you what happens when you go and God is in you. When you go and God is in you, you get burning with your learning. Here's what happens to us. We get just so much of God. And then that's all we want. We only come to church whenever we feel like we need to be at church. And that's enough. We only give God so much and we say that's enough. We only do enough for God. But what God, and this is what Simon, it, it helped me to say, God, whatever it takes, whatever I got to go through, whatever things come up in my life, Lord, I'm going to do whatever you command me to do. If it takes stand up all night long, if don't nobody stand with me, if don't nobody go with me, if don't nobody believe with me, God, I'm still going to believe. The doors that it opened up, it opens up doors. How many of y'all got education? Everybody ain't got education. Everybody raise their hand. Everybody, can I have a, can I have a, 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 everybody raise their hand. How many got education? How did you get it? God, come on. She got it. God gave it to you. Let me tell you what education is. An education is not so much going to a college or a school or matriculating. Education becomes the testimony that God gave you. This is what I mean by it. But if you don't do what God told you to do, see, I wouldn't tell everybody to go to seminary. Seminary ain't for everybody. Because when you get to seminary, see, seminary is not a Bible school. 
People think seminary, you're going to be praying and walking around and, and you know, oh, praying, uh, reading the Bible. That ain't seminary. Seminary challenges your faith. Seminary rocks your spiritual world. It does. Seminary ain't for everybody, but it was for me. The reason why God wants you to have faith is so you can have a testimony. He wants you to be able to tell your story about his glory, about his goodness, about his blessings, about how he made a way for you when there wasn't no way. We got a house, y'all, that we couldn't afford. Three years. I was in seminary three years. I don't know how we made it. I slept three hours a night for three years. Just three hours. Couldn't get no more than that. I don't know how I did it. Y'all don't like my testimony? Y'all not happy about my testimony? God hooked me up in Atlanta. I had an internship invitation at the King Center. I sat at the Butler Street YMCA. Some of y'all, if you know your history, you know what I'm talking about. They're on Auburn Avenue. Right up from King's Church, right up from, from, from the King Center, right up from there is the Butler Street YMCA. In the Butler Street YMCA is where King said, it where a, a, a Andrew Young said, it's where all those folks who formed civil rights, it's where they were at. I got to shake hands and know the King family, Mrs. King, a whole lot of folks and other folks. God hooked me up. I didn't do my internship at the King Center. Y'all don't like my testimony. Tell somebody, so don't hate, don't, don't hate, don't. Don't hate on this testimony. Come on, help somebody out. Say, don't hate on pastor testimony. God said, that's not the place. God said, go over there to the, what, what was those projects, man? I was at the Paris house. What, what was the what? It's the Paris house, but what was it projects? Yeah, it was, that's where I did my internship at. Because that's what God led me. But where it led me, you all, to places that allowed other doors to come open. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm going to finish telling my testimony, but I don't have time. So I'm going to tell you this. The doors that God began to open then are open now. And let me tell you something. Can't nobody close them. Because there's some people who don't like my testimony. Not y'all. There's some folks that really don't like my testimony. There, there, there's some people that really wish they could stop me and get me. And that's why I can say what I need to say. Let, let me tell you what God wants to do for your life. God wants to bless you with wealth can't nobody take. God wants to bless you with doors can't nobody close. God wants to put you before great people because he says your gift will make a way for you and open doors for you and bring you before great men. God wants to put you at the feet of people who need what you have because you have what you have and can't nobody take it. Because when God blesses you, can't nobody curse you. When God opens a door, can't nobody close the door. When God makes a way, I don't care who don't like it. I don't care who don't like you. They can't do nothing about it. Here's my point. My point is this last part of my testimony. I'm not done with my testimony. I'm going to tell it in the weeks to come. Listen, point number two. God wants to put you in a place to where you're not owing any man. This is important. To where you don't owe nobody. To where you can stand flat footed and tell it like it is. To where you don't have to laugh when you don't feel like laughing. Where you don't have to shuffle. Where you don't have to grin if it ain't funny. 
Well, you ain't got a scratch if you ain't itching. <laughs> Y'all, somebody know. <laughs> well, oh, bless the name of Jesus. So here's point number two. If you can believe, you can. You can if you believe, you can. You can if you believe, you can. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Put your hand right here on your chest and say, I can. If I believe, I can. I can because I believe it. I can do it because I can believe it. I can have joy because I believe I can have joy. I can have peace because I believe I can have peace. I can have a healthy, happy relationship because I believe I can. I can have my dream job because I believe I can. I can have the business because I believe I can have the business. I can have what God says I can have because he says all things are possible to him who believe. Who's flying the plane? Who's flying the plane? Who's flying the plane? You are God. You are God. God is flying the plane. You ain't even got no pilot license. You can't even fly no plane. So we don't even think about the pilot until there's turbulence. Last time you got on the plane, you didn't think about who was flying the plane. You didn't even think about it. You bought your little ticket, you stood in line, you got on the board, on the, board the, the plane, and you got in there and sat down. You didn't demand to see the pilot. You didn't say, who's the pilot? Where's the pilot? Does the pilot know how to fly? Does the pilot know where to go? By faith. Come on now. Don't tell me you ain't got no faith. If you can fly today, you got to have some faith. By faith, you got on the plane. By faith, you sat out in your seat. By faith, you buckled up. By faith. When turbulence comes, then the pilot becomes instantly more important than anybody else because your life is in the pilot's hand. <laughs> your life is in the pilot's hand. Come on, say, my life is in the pilot's hand. In his hands. In his hands. There's, there's a great song. I, I wish I could sing it. I wish I had. It says, in his hand. In his hand. My life. My all. Is in his hand. In his hand in his hands my life my all is in his hand I made a mess I must confess my life was all distressed but he made it new it's really 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 true and now in his hands I rest tell somebody I'm in his hands I'm in his hands as you as you 